pleased and I'm looking forward to the same kind of enjoyment, intellectual stimulation as yesterday. Once again, I have the proud privilege of introducing Professor Devi. Professor Ganesh Devi completed his BA in English Literature from Shivaji University in the year 1970. Later, he had a double master's from the University of Mar Shivaji University of Maharashtra in 1973 and also the Leeds University, UK, in 1979. Shivaji University awarded him a PhD degree in English Literature in 1978. Professor Devi started his career as a lecturer in the Department of English in Maharaja Sayaji Rao University, Baroda, and then swiftly rose to the post of, post of reader and later professor. From 2003 to 15, he was designated Professor of Humanities at the Dhirubhai Ambani's Institute, Gandhi. Besides excelling as a teacher and as a writer, Professor Devi is known for the honorary work, the stellar work he has done to promote the cause of the underprivileged and their languages. He was the founding director of the Adivasi Academy in Tejgarh, Gujarat. Till 2002, 1996-2002. During the same period, he was the founder trustee of the Bhasha Research and Publication Center in Baroda. From 1996 to 2008, he was the founder secretary of the Denotified and Nomadic Tribes Rights Action Group. And from 2010 to 2018, he has been the honorary chair of the People's Linguistic Survey of India. This, friends, is a monumental work. A monumental work covering 780 languages with approximately 3,000 volunteers. For three years, from 2015 to 2018, he also did honorary work as convener, Dakshinayan, a writer's movement. And from 2016 to 18, he has been honorary professor, Center for Multidisciplinary Development and Research in Harvard, <coughs> Karnataka. So Professor Devi, has really made an outstanding contribution to the field of language, literature, as well as social work. He has authored a number of books in Marathi, Gujarati, I shall name but a few. Samavad, Adivasi, Janeche, Trijya, and Banavars. His publications in English are also numerous. I'll again name just a few. After Amnesia, which got the Science Academy Award in 1990, the Academy in 1993, right? Indian Literary Criticism Theory and Interpretation, A Nomad Called Thief, and Countering Violence in 2019. In 2009, Orient Black Swan published The G. N. Devi Freedom. Professor Devi's books have been translated into several Indian languages. He also has received innumerable prestigious awards. To name a few, the Padmashri by the President of India, the Sayaji Lok Bhasha Sanman Bank of Baroda, the Durga Bhagavat Award, the Saak Writers Foundation Award. In addition, Professor Devi has been conferred various fellowships, such as the Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship, Fulbright Fellowship, the Simmons Fellowship, the Commonwealth Academic Exchange Fellowship, and the Rotary Foundation Fellowship. We are indeed blessed, honored to have him here with us on us immediately on the consecutive second evening and look forward to his talk. Now I shall briefly introduce you to Mr. Kumar Kedkar, who has graciously accepted to chair this function. He has been a journalist, as we all know, for several years, nearly 50 years. He was the chief editor of Lok Sutta, Maharashtra Times, a special correspondent for the Economic Times, and currently he is the member of parliament, Rajya Sabha, and has reported in newspapers from all over the world, Washington, Moscow, London, Beijing, Berlin. He's a panelist on TV channels as a political commentator, and currently he is a member of several international organizations. He's also authored many books. Here also I'll name but a few. Jwala Mukhi Cha Tondavar, Katha Swatantra Ji, Vishwamitra Sejur, Trikal Vail, Badalte Vishwa. I shall also add that he received the prestigious Padma Shri in 2001. Thank you.
people I feel to the Asiatic society. Members and the office bearers of this organization for giving this forum to me on two consecutive evenings. When I stand at the end of half century of my intellectual life, and the world stands at the middle point of the journey of the homo sapiens. Thank you so much. Yesterday, I tried to place before you the context, the intellectual context, in which the term civilization surfaced at the beginning of the 19th century in European intellectual discourse for recognizing or naming or defining discovery of an ancient people, ancient uh, cultural efflorescence in the East. And I said yesterday, that because Europe was passing through a new phase of having to come to terms with city formation, the idea of civilization suddenly became an idea that had currency. I have drawn the etymological detail into that argument that civil is essentially city in the Latin language. And therefore, the term civilization is all that is to do with city, cities. And not to be confused with the term culture. Culture, as in, I mean, in uh, the organic sense, cultivation, and in the synthetic sense, addition of some new trait, is a different matter. It is pervasive. You cannot escape culture. Wherever you are, whatever you are, you are in the middle of some cultural context. Civilization is a particular moment in history, as was seen in the 19th century by Europeans. And for Europeans, for the European scholars, that moment in history was the moment when ancient people quite amazingly, quite surprisingly, quite unexpectedly are found building big cities. It is as if some young child going to a school, knowing that his or her parents are illiterate, the grandparents are illiterate, the grand grandparents are illiterate, illiterate and but suddenly finds that some 20 generations ago, one of the ancestors had three PhDs. The amazement, the sudden, you know, the scale, the unbelievable accomplishment of the intellect, the great skills in management of that scale of social unit was recognized by the term civilization in Europe in the 19th century. Yesterday, I presented this before you in, a, in great detail and I said this recognition of that ancient past, accomplishment of the ancient times, was fueled from places like Calcutta, but mainly by Bombay or Calcutta, Bombay, maybe uh, Kobo, Calcutta, Bombay. That was the fuel for recognition of the ancient achievement. And William Jones became the instrument for that, an accidental instrument for that, who suddenly opened an invisible door and said, hey, look, some four or five thousand years ago, you ancestors and my ancestors of my people in Europe, the, 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 the elders, the eldest of the elders of the Greeks 
and the Latin speakers, they all seem to have shared some common skies, common universe, common intellectual domain. They, they come from the same language. Jones, to be sure, was also thinking not just of words that were common, but he was thinking of the intellectual concerns that were in common. Because Jones was not a trained linguist. His contribution to linguistics, though an epoch-making contribution, itself was restricted to one paragraph of a speech in which he had posited the idea that there is I mean, he had a hypothesis that because uh, Persian, Sanskrit, Latin, Greek have common words, there was possibly, he was saying, there was possibly, perhaps, there was a proto-language of which these are the branches. And therefore, if there was a proto-language, that means that time is older than the earliest known record, which is the Vedas, which is 1400 years before Christ, which said, about 4,000 years before, uh, 3,800, years before our time. There must be a language prior to that. This is all that he said. And, and scholars of, for the entire century chased that idea through the 19th century, particularly the German scholars it, uh, and the French linguists, the German linguists and French linguists chased that idea, brought terminologies together, compared them, compared them and, and established that yes, uh, these languages were at one time uh, connected, they got segregated, they migrated along these particular territories and so on and so forth. And not just that, when there is a position, intellectual position, there follows inevitably an allied or a counter position. And therefore soon after, in 20 years time after William Jones, there is the idea of a Dravidic language family. And if half a century later, that idea also gets settled. And so you have in country like India, indo aryan languages, Dravidic languages, the Indo-European languages, the Indic languages. The whole business, uh, I mean, uh, Will, uh, uh, William Jones opened a uh, scholarship ka baja, a very active, very, very, uh, Live uh, uh, marketplace of knowledge. He created a new mark, new knowledge space, and affected. He influenced disciplines like anthropology, linguistics, uh, religion study, myth study, culture study, all kinds of, uh, including economics. I said and medicine because both of those disciplines, as Foucault has you know, established, uh, uh, kind of. Followed the, followed the trail and argued that every unit affects the entire system. And uh, anyway, I said all this yesterday to explain the term civilization. And then I said with utmost humility that now at the beginning of the 21st century, we have an opportunity and also a necessity to reuse the term civilization in the context of the city that appears to have become a liability in the intellectual discourse constructed around this. I mentioned that city, I, I mean I mentioned I did, should not have, I did not actually, but the city appears to be liability because the city today is, is the idea of city today is seen as consuming, exhausting, dragging, dragging humanity and bringing the entire homo sapiens species close to extinction. I refer to the term Anthropocene as against the term Holocene. I mean, for some, there are some young students there and for them, let me add, Holocene is that time, as I said yesterday, roughly 11,500 or 500 years before Christ when the, the climate started 
the temperature started going up and therefore the snows covering the earth started melting about 10 degrees south of the equator and 10 degrees north of the equator life became very lush Trunamun Trunamun means not TMC the grass the blades grass started growing birds started chirping animals came to eat those birds animals started growing and animals were there humans started growing human civilization human existence became possible that was Holocene Anthropocene is the time when after repeated outcry and alarms coming from activists, climate activists and so on and also uh, uh, worries and anxieties uh, coming from the uh, urban uh, planners, planners of urban habitats, scientists decided to declare that humans have crossed all tipping points climatically, ecologically, taking us to disaster. This happened about six or seven years ago. In London, scientists actually stood together and said, we have come to the end of Holocene and entered Anthropocene. Anthropocene, in simple words, is a time, era, yuga, when the carbon footprint of humans will only multiply and not be reduced, though the speed of the multiplication can be reduced. And this multiplication of the carbon footprint will go on to a point when you and I, along with hundreds and thousands of other species, go extinct. This was an official scientific announcement that came up in 2017. This came a precise the a month before or after the Brexit, uh, I think, was happening. I said yesterday that since we have now city as the villain in this business of increased Anthropocene, progressing prog the progress of Anthropocene, since the city is kind of seen as the villain in decline in our environmental wealth, ecological conditions, the city is seen as the as the uh, as the merchant of degradation. Degradation. Uh, we have time to think of if we can rethink the city. And rethinking the city is, in simple other words, is rethinking civilization. I am not talking about re our rethinking what was there in Mohenjo-Dorongara or what was there in Egypt or in Mesopotamia. I am thinking, I am talking of rethinking our cities. And yesterday I had spelled out the term our, when I said uh, our cities, I said let's look at Eden, Shanghai, I mean the colonial cities were a peculiar creation. I had mentioned yesterday that Bombay was not like Madurai or Banaras. Bombay did not come up as a city of pilgrimage, though Mahim initially was some Mahima Devi or Mahimata. But Bombay did not come up as a city of Devi or, De or Dev or Devta. It came up as a city of humans with their frailties, with their flaws, with their wickedness, but with their aspirations, their large-heartedness. I mean, it came up. So, Bombay city combined modernity, but it was not just modern. I mean, we had one of the members of uh, Asiatic society at the beginning of the 19th century was a man called Briggs. And Briggs, uh, among many other things he did, he also identified Mahableshwar and made it the uh, 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 sanatorium for the British you know, who wanted to recover from various ailments. Bombay was not like Mahableshwar. 
It was not a city. It was not a place for exclusion. It was not like Simla. It was not a place for uh, you know, uh, protecting yourself, you know, guarding yourself, uh, kind of building a castle round. Bombay was an open place. Bombay brought in uh, causeways and uh, what was seven islands was turned into a connect. Bombay was the place to connect. 1845 or so, Suez Canal opened and Bombay suddenly became the place to connect the rest of the world. American ships used to come here, the British ships used to come here, African ships used to every, every part of the world was coming into Bombay and every part of the world was coming into Shanghai and Aden and Karachi. These cities were in a way, I mean, if, if I'm not terribly keen on this term, but if you like for for what they say, easification, the ease of, ease of uh, speech. I call it a secular city. But that's not the best description of this place. This city was created as a city that will become prototype for the future. I had added yesterday, since uh, uh, Honorable <coughs> Kumar Kepkar was not there yesterday, I would like to mention that does Bombay have only assimilating, uh, connecting, uh, reconciliating, negotiating, conversing as its foundations? Or does it also have ideological foundation? And there I, I said that Bombay, as I understand, is the Bombay presidency that uh, uh, Elphinstone uh, formulated in 1828, 27 or 28. And that Bombay presidency extended from uh, your uh, Nadia, Bharuj, Baroda, and uh, Satara, Kolapur, Dharwad, and in the east to uh, Vidarbha and Nagpur. The tradition of these, the Bombay presidency intellectual tradition is a unique intellectual tradition. It has Aurangabad with Sufi tradition. It has Dharwad with music tradition. It has Pune with intellectual tradition. It has thinkers. It has, it has so many places with Bhakti tradition. It has tradition of great warriors who defended human rights, civil rights, who defended justice. It has, it, it, it has the tradition of thinkers who, 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 who position equality as the, pre, as the civilizational principle above anything else, like Dr. Ambedkar. And beyond that, it had, the, I mean, Bombay Presidency stands on the tradition of the thought of Mahatma Gandhi, of truth. Can you think of any other civilization in the world which has truth as the foundation? The closest to it would be the Greek civilization where Socrates was killed for truth. Gandhi too was killed, but not for that value. It's a more complex issue. So don't provide immediate value. I was saying, that in the new situation that humans have been facing, we have to bring in the question of civilization once again and perhaps produce a new, new knowledge, new scholarship, new action from Bombay, from the Asiatic society, from the Bombay presidency, which will show a new light to the rest of the world. I said yesterday that I am here not to give analytical lectures, but to propose a kind of an action, kind of an action. Now what is that action? I will answer that question. And before that, I will also answer a question that was asked to me today in the light of what I had said yesterday. So with your permission, sir, the question that was asked to me today in the light of what I was saying yesterday was 
a friend came and he said, after all, what does civilization need? A religion, a guru, a god, a temple, a prayer. That makes it religion. Uh, that makes it civilization. My answer to that statement is, civilization, the idea of civilization has nothing to do with gods, gurus, temples, religions. The Indian civilization has no clear indication of temples. There are public places which are sacred, but there is no presence of any God. There is no presence of any religion. There is no presence of any prayer. What is present there in the in the Arapanans, Arapan and Sindhu Sanskriti, what is present there is health for everybody. There is good drainage. It, it's outstanding public irrigation drainage system. Outstanding. I mean, it's amazing for us to see how they are planned. Housing is good. There is space for movement. There is facility for trading. And most importantly, if you, if you look at the structure of any of those hundreds of cities of Sindhu, Sanskriti, Sindhu, what we call Sindhu, I mean we have this question of what is the word in Indian languages for civilization, is it Sanskriti or Sabdata or, I, therefore I am just using the term civilization, but we coin some good word for Indian languages, because Sanskriti is not culture. Sanskriti is those who go close to Sanskrit language, some upward mobility is involved. Prakruti is also not culture uh, because that is uh, that is Im, uh, embedded, it is pre-given as something. Like the most crucial element of the Sindhu Sanskriti, the, the, the Indus civilization, I am using the term civilization, the most crucial element, most essential element was Spaces made for entertaining outsiders. The number of cars that could be accommodated, not cars, cars. I mean the parking, the parking place, the parking space in the Indus civilization was amazingly generous and kind. It reflects a value. It reflected the value that if there is an Assyrian coming to Indus civilization, he or she is welcome if there is somebody coming from the Iran and bringing some agricultural goods or fruit or dry food. Most welcome if somebody is coming from, let's say, not too distant the borders of northern Afghanistan with dry food, or they are welcome. If somebody comes there to sing, welcome. These, the entire Indus civilization shows no trace of any army, navy or air force, uh, I am tempted to say because some friends say that in those days that there were planes and all that, but there was no army or navy. The idea of fighting an enemy does not exist there. I am not saying they were all saints, but I am saying that their, their sense of security, the way they have structured themselves, the security was built into the structure of the city. Yes. Was that a civilization? The answer is yes. And if that was a civilization, then whether there is a religion, god, priest, temple or no, a civilization can still exist. That is it. So, so what this temple, god, guru and they are great things. But they are a material expression of a certain mental attitude to the nature of reality surrounding us. It is a mental attitude to a world view in which humans start imagining or believing or accepting that there is a certain power which is beyond human understanding and that is the birth of religion and that, that also is a need of the human mind. I don't rule it out. But the two are different issues. There can be a civilization with a religion in 
there can be civilization without religion. The two are not, uh, you know, uh, options to civilization is civilization. Now, Bombay is another civilization. Bombay like I am not saying Bombay civilization. Bombay is prototype of that civilization. Where I mean, what is the religion of these cities? What is the what the gurus of these cities? Which are the temples? There are of course temples in Bombay, but all kinds of temples. I will return to that larger question. That I mean, having answered your question, I will now move to the question I wanted to answer. Is why do we have to look forward and think of humanity from our perspective? in order to create new knowledge which will, which will help the progress of the humans in the future. What is the need? Uh, yesterday I had built one strand, I said American foreign policy dictated by this idea of crisis of civilization has put people and nations and civilizations and you know, societies at loggerheads and they have been killing each other for the last 30 years if they cannot find opportunity to kill each other or one another, they at least hate and hatred has become the general atmosphere in the world. Hatred, whether you are in UK or France or Spain or in India or Afghanistan, hatred has dominated, been dominating fear on one side and hatred on the other side. Have been the two bullocks driving the cart of human society in the last 30, 40 years. What is the need? I mean, I had said that yesterday, but there is something larger. Uh, ever since the Homo sapiens came about, replacing Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and, and forming their own, own communities, and ever since they started moving out, out of Africa, Homo sapiens, some 70, 75,000, 65,000 years ago, they have always done two things. I mean, they have done many other things, but essentially two things. One is to invent new tools to reduce their labor. So initially they invented some uh, flints, chips uh, with stone for brushing, breaking, crushing, polishing, pulling, pushing uh, and all that. Then they moved to not just stone and wood, but metals and made tools and weapons, I mean bones, rocks, wood, bones, metals, and then more sophisticated metallic uh, things which will reduce the labor of humans. That's, that's one thing. A city continues that tradition. The city continues that tradition of bringing in more sophisticated tools and reducing the labor of humans. That is the second thing that humans have done all around is to try and attain a scale. Making tools is a materially concrete thing, but attaining scale is an abstract thing and it's a mental attitude, aspiration, thought, capacity and assessment. This, the question of scale needs to be spelled out a little bit. When humans moved out of Africa, they were walking and when they, they had to face water, they waded through, occasionally they swam, water, they climbed hills, they climbed hills, they, they jumped and so on, walking. In order to protect themselves from attacks by other animals, they were in homes, they were in groups. They were not individuals walking, they were not like Tagore's Ekla Chalove or Mahatma Gandhi walking alone in you know, Naukali, not that. Clans, homes, groups. Clan formation was a need for human survival. And these clans had a certain predictable size feature. The size was predictable. 
anthropologists have uh, tell us that the ideal size of a clam Uh, let me put it more accurately. After the first two major migrations, that is 65,000 years before our time and 45,000 years before our time, let's see about 30,000 years or 25,000 years before our time, when people were living in uh, Bhimbetka. Some of you have seen Bhimbetka caves in Madhya Pradesh. The ideal size of a plant was about 800 to 900. Anthropologists have done immense amount of work to figure out why eight or nine hundred people are necessary to protect the group on all four sides and uh, to communicate with each other, to form regulations, to uh, produce, uh, collect food, distribute reproduction, and also uh, uh, making marriages possible within the group. Endogamous clan based marriages. The properties of these clans increase. I mean, a clan with property of cows had a gotra. Go was the defining feature of that clan. So, kula and gotra. But I am not getting into kula, gotra. I am not justifying any of those things. I am trying to tell you about the size, the, sc the scale. scale. When, when humans had moved from hunting gathering to past pastoral pastoralism and nomadic uh, uh, habits into agriculture they had started accumulating the surplus of agriculture and they gained a certain confidence that the surplus may allow them to have larger number in the group in the clan in the society than they earlier had and that was the beginning of their aspiration to build cities. The typical city of Indus had 10,000 population, which is 10 times the size of a clan. That is, with increased capacity to save surplus, because agriculture allowed that, they had aspiration to create a city they had the aspiration to create a civilization. They replicated this. The earliest, uh, the earliest uh, settlements of the, what we call this in, in the civilization, etc., they go back to nearly 3500 years before Christ. The mature phase is 2500 years before Christ to 1900 years before Christ. That's about four and a half thousand years before our time to roughly 4000 years before our time, roughly. Five, six hundred years, mature phase. And in that, so many cities were built. They did not build one mega city. They built so many cities of the size of 5,000 or 10,000 population, 7,000 population, 80,000 population, and so on. Because they thought those cities would survive. But they did not. Because humans had missed, of those, that time had miscalculated, they had overlooked a possible risk which eventually destroyed that civilization. That risk was not of food supply, not of attacks from outside or floods. The risk was change in the temperature. Because 12,000 years before our time, Holocene began, but there was 2,000 years. After 12,000 before this, about 10,000 years before our time, temperature went down once again for almost eight to 900 years. And during the Indus time, that is 1900 years before Christ, 4,000 years before our time, till about 1500 years before our time, almost 500 years, the weather change changed the landscape. It created desert where there was a rain. It caused water shortage because rain falls in the ground. The scale that they had imagined was a wrong calculation and that's how that civilization went down. This is just Indus. But if, if you go to the, uh, the Assyrian or the Akkadian, they thought that they can maintain the scale of a large city 
by building armies which as and when necessary can go out and with the use of horses which they had by then actually managed to uh, control, master, could bring materials in. But they did not calculate the risk of allowing young men to go out for long years without being able to produce children locally. So the litter spread, but the local population started fragmenting. And that's the reason why the Assyrian Empire, 2200 years before Christ, they were writing. They have kept records, the kings have kept records. The, for seven or eight hundred years afterwards, the kings remained in the namesake, just as we have some uh, Mokya Pati Saraja and Dakya Pati Saraja in you know, Chota Chota Gao. The kings remained, but the large cities had gone down. From the middle of the 18th century till now, humans have constructed cities. In America, it was not just the gold rush, but it was also the use of technology. In Europe, it was the production of material that could be sold out, so that could be sold in the, the colonies. In the colonies, uh, cities that would uh, harness raw material and then make them into half-finished goods for supply all over the world. Cities, the scales increase. We today come to a stage when we do not know how to cope with that scale. And very typically, typically I am saying because the human mind always comes up with a solution which is once tried out somewhere till it starts failing them, till it starts failing humans. Our solution appears to be rather ridiculous and please pardon me for saying this, the idea of going back to the village, the most great nostalgia for village, countryside, I mean how many rich people are building country, country houses? That has happened in England, it doesn't work. We think that if all of us go back to villages, then we will survive as homo sapiens. That is not the answer. The answer is for us to rethink what a city can be. And I'm not talking here just of, I'm not talking of urban management and so on. I'm talking of the ideas which found our city. The Bombay Presidency has an ideological legacy, wealth. If we somehow bring those ideas into legislating, managing, imagining our cities, if we say that our cities will cities, even if it sounds a self-contradiction for a while, because we cannot go back to villages, Anymore. Our villages are also mentally cities, just as our cities are mentally villages. We are, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great strength that we have. We combine tradition and modernity, we combine the rural and the urban, we combine male and female. Yesterday I stopped, my last sentence was, therefore the great Nataraja is kept. The, the, the ambivalent, the androgynous, Ashish Nandi has this thesis. That's a great androgyny, is a great instrument of resistance. We do not know, Gandhi used it in his times, but we, we have not thought of using it. If we can reconceptualize what civilization is from a city like Bombay and produce a body of knowledge about Asian cities, the colonial cities, the non-Western cities, the non-pilgrimage cities, the non-empire cities, the non-dharma cities, but the human cities. If we can reconceptualize on the basis of what they do, what they have done, what their intellectual legacies are, bring those legacies together, we can build a new, we can build a new humanism which will allow us to go past this crisis of Anthropocene. Otherwise, Fukuyama said that this is the end of history. Uh, Huntington said that you will always clash each, you know, 
among clash of civilizations and your future is to break each other's heads and hatred and contempt and scorn alone seem to be the you know uh, the paths ahead of us we have to change all this i am saying that it is possible to do so i said yesterday just as william jones opened a new vista on thinking about civilization at the beginning of the 19th century and cities were coming up we have to open a new vista thinking of civilization when the cities are seen to be dragging the world down and give this world a new lease of life and please don't think i am arrogant but i am saying this kind of work bombay can do. this will need a lot of explication a lot of discussion but i feel confident that this can be done and i i said yesterday that i having completed 50 years of my life as an intellectual i want to start a new journey a new voyage is a voyage into study of asia not for accumulating scholarship but for creating action towards regenerating the city the idea of city the idea of civilization so that humans have an existence in future where equality freedom and justice have a chance and where love and conversation and negotiation become the norms thank you so much humans <laughs> covering the earth started melting about 10 degrees south of the equator and 10 degrees north of the equator life became very lush trunamun the trunamun is not tmc the grass the blades grass started growing birds started chirping animals came to eat those birds animals started growing and animals were human started growing human civilization human existence became possible that was how was it anthropocene is the time when after repeated outcry and alarms coming from activists climate activists and so on and also uh, uh, worries and anxieties uh, coming from the uh, urban uh, planners planners of urban habitats scientists decided to declare that humans have crossed all tipping points climatically ecologically taking us to disaster this happened about 6 or 7 years ago in london scientists actually stood together and said we have come to the end of holocene and entered anthropocene anthropocene in simple words is a time era yuga when the carbon footprint of humans will only multiply and not be reduced though the speed of the multiplication can be reduced and this multiplication of the carbon footprint will go on to a point when you and i along with hundreds and thousands of other species go extinct this was an official scientific announcement that came up in 2017 this came a precise the a month before or after the brexit uh, i think was happening i said yesterday that since we have now city as the villain in this business of increased anthropocene progressing prog- the progress of anthropocene since the city is kind of seen as the villain in decline in our environmental wealth ecological conditions the city is seen as the as the uh, as the merchant of degradation degradation uh, we have time to think of if we can rethink the city and rethinking the city is 
in simple other words, is rethinking civilization. I am not talking about re our rethinking what was there in Mohenjo or what was there in Egypt or in Mesopotamia. I am thinking, I am talking of rethinking our cities. And yesterday I had spelled out the term our, when I said uh, our cities, I said let's look at Eden, Shanghai, I mean the colonial cities were a peculiar creation. I had mentioned yesterday that Bombay was not like Madurai or Banaras. Bombay did not come up as a city of pilgrimage. Though Mahim initially was some Mahima Devi or Mahimata, but Bombay did not come up as a city of Devi or Dev or Devata. It came up as a city of humans with their frailties, with their flaws, with their wickedness, but with their aspirations, their large heartedness. I mean, it came up. So, Bombay city combined modernity, but it was not just modern. I mean, we had one of the members of uh, Asiatic society at the beginning of the 19th century was a man called Briggs. And Briggs, uh, among many other things he did, he also identified Mahableshwar and made it the uh, uh, sanatorium for the British you know, who wanted to recover from various ailments. Bombay was not like Mahableshwar. It was not a city, it was not a place for exclusion, it was not like Simla. It was not a place for uh, uh, you know, uh, protecting your, you know, guarding yourself, uh, kind of building a castle round. Bombay was an open place. Bombay brought in uh, causeways and uh, what was seven islands was turned into a connect. Bombay was the place to connect. 1845 or so, Suez Canal opened and Bombay suddenly became the place to connect the rest of the world. American ships used to come here, the British ships used to come here, African ships used to come every, every part of the world was coming into Bombay and every part of the world was coming into Shanghai and Aden and Karachi. These cities were in a way, I mean if I am not terribly keen on this term but if you like for or what they say, easification, the ease of, ease of the speech. I call it a secular city. But that's not the best description of this place. This city was created as a city that will become prototype for the future. I had added yesterday, since the uh, uh, Honorable <coughs> Kumar Ketkar was not there yesterday, I would like to mention that does Bombay have only assimilating, uh, connecting, uh, reconciliating, negotiating, conversing as its foundations? Or does it also have ideological foundation? And there I, I said that Bombay, as I understand, is the Bombay presidency that uh, uh, Elphinstone uh, formulated in 1828, 27 or 28. And that Bombay presidency extended from uh, your uh, Nadia, Bharuj, Baroda, and uh, Satara, Kolapur, Dharwad, and in the east to uh, Vidarbha and Nagpur. The tradition of these, the Bombay presidency intellectual tradition is a unique intellectual tradition. It has Aurangabad with Sufi tradition. It has Dharwad with music tradition. It has Pune with intellectual tradition. It has thinkers. It has, it has so many places with Bhakti tradition. It has tradition of great warriors who defended human rights, civil rights, who defended justice. It has, it, it, it has the tradition of thinkers who, 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 who position equality as the, as the civilizational principle above anything else. 
like Dr. Ambedkar. And beyond that, it had the, I mean, Bombay Presidency stands on the tradition of the thought of Mahatma Gandhi, of truth. Can you think of any other civilization in the world which has truth as the foundation? The closest to it would be the Greek civilization, where Socrates was killed for truth. Gandhi too was killed, but not for that value. It's a more complex issue. So don't draw it immediately. I was saying that in the new situation that humans have been facing, we have to bring in the question of civilization once again and perhaps produce a new, new knowledge, new scholarship, new action from Bombay, from the Asiatic Society, from the Bombay Presidency, which will show a new light to the rest of the world. I said yesterday that I am here not to give analytical lectures, but to propose a kind of an action, kind of an action. Now what is that action? I will answer that question. And before that, I will also answer a question that was asked to me today in the light of what I had said yesterday. So with your permission, sir, the question that was asked to me today in the light of what I was saying yesterday was, a friend came and he said, after all, what does civilization need? A religion, a guru, a god, a temple, a prayer. That makes it religion. Uh, that makes it... My answer to that statement is, civilization, the idea of civilization, has nothing to do with gods, gurus, temples, religions. The Indian civilization has no clear indication of temples. There are public places which are sacred, but there is no presence of any God. There is no presence of any religion. There is no presence of any prayer. What is present there in the in the Arapamans, Sindhu Sanskriti, what is present there is health for everybody. There is good drainage. It, it's outstanding public irrigation drainage system. Outstanding. I mean, it's amazing for us to see how they are planned. Housing is good. There is space for movement. There is facility for trading. And most importantly, if you, if you look at the structure of any of those hundreds of cities of Sindhu, Sanskriti, Sindhu, what we call Sindhu, I mean we have this question of what is the word in Indian language for civilization, is it Sanskriti or Sabdata or... I, therefore I am just using the term civilization, or we coin some good word for Indian languages. Because Sanskriti is not culture. Sanskriti is those who go close to Sanskrit language, some upward mobility is involved. Prakruti is also not culture uh, because that is, uh, that is in, uh, embedded, it is pre-given as something like that. The most crucial element of the Sindhu Sanskriti, the, the, the Indus civilization, I am using the term civilization, the most crucial element, most essential element was Spaces made for entertaining outsiders. The number of cars that could be accommodated, not cars, cars. I mean the parking, the parking place, the parking space in the Indus civilization was amazingly generous and kind. It reflects a value. It reflected the value that if there is an Assyrian coming to India civilization, he or she is welcome if there is somebody coming from the Iran and bringing some agricultural goods or fruit or dry food. Most welcome if somebody is coming from, let's say, 
not too distant the borders of northern Afghanistan with dry food, they welcome. If somebody comes there to sing, welcome. These, the entire Indus civilization shows no trace of any army, navy or air force. Uh, I am tempted to say because some friends say that in those days that there were planes and all that, but there was no army or navy. The idea of fighting an enemy does not exist there. I am not saying they were all saints, but I am saying that their, their sense of security, the way they have structured themselves, the security was built into the structure of the city. Yes. Was that a civilization? The answer is yes. And if that was a civilization, then whether there is a religion, god, priest, temple or no, a civilization can still exist. That is it. so. So, what this temple, God, Guru, and their great things, but they are a material expression of a certain mental attitude to the nature of reality surrounding us. It is a mental attitude to a worldview in which humans start imagining or believing or accepting that there is a certain power which is beyond human understanding and that is the birth of religion and that, that also is a need of the human mind, I don't rule it out, but the two are different issues. There can be a civilization with a religion, in, there can be a civilization without religion in it. The two are not, uh, you know, uh, options to, civilization is civilization. Now, Bombay is another civilization, Bombay likes it, I am not saying Bombay civilization, Bombay has prototype of that civilization where, uh, I mean, what is the religion of these cities, what is the, what the gurus of these cities, which are the temples. There are of course temples in Bombay, but all kinds of temples. I will return to that larger question that, I mean, I, having answered your question, I will now move to the question I wanted to answer, is why do we have to look forward and think of humanity from our perspective in order to create new knowledge which will, which will help the progress of the humans in future. What is the need? Uh, yesterday I had built one strand, I said American foreign policy dictated by this idea of crisis of civilization has put people and nations and civilizations and you know societies at loggerheads and they've been killing each other for the last 30 years. If they cannot find opportunity to kill each other, one another, they at least hate. And hatred has become the general atmosphere in the world. Hatred, whether you are in UK or France or Spain or in India or Afghanistan, hatred has dominated, been dominating fear on one side and hatred on the other side. Have been the two bullocks driving the car talk human uh, society in the last 30-40 years. What is the need? I mean, I had said that yesterday, but there is something larger. Uh, ever since the Homo sapiens came about, they replacing Neanderthals, to Homo erectus, and, and forming their own, own communities, and ever since they started moving out out of Africa, Homo sapiens, some 70, 75,000, 65,000 years ago. They have always done two things. I mean, they have done many other things, but essentially two things. One is to invent new tools to reduce their labor. So initially they invented some uh, flints, chips, uh, with stone for brushing, breaking, crushing, polishing, pulling, pushing, uh, and all that. Uh, then they moved to not just stone and wood, but metals, and made tools and weapons, I mean, uh, bones, rocks, wood, bones, metals, and then more sophisticated metallic uh, things 
which will reduce the labor of humans. That's that's one thing. A city continues that tradition. A city continues that tradition of bringing in more sophisticated tools and reducing the labor of humans. That is. The second thing that humans have done all around is to try and attain a scale. Making tools is a materially concrete thing. But attaining scale is an abstract thing and it's a mental attitude, aspiration, thought, capacity and assessment. This, the question of scale needs to be spelled out a little bit. When humans moved out of Africa, they were walking and when they, they had to face water, they waded through, occasionally they swam, water, they climbed hills, they climbed hills, they, they jumped and so on, walking. In order to protect themselves from attacks by other animals, they were in holes, they were in groups. They were not individuals walking. They were not like Tagore's Ekla Chalove or Mahatma Gandhi walking alone in you know, Naukali. Not that. Clans, hordes, groups. Clan formation was a need for human survival. And these clans had a certain predictable size feature. The size was predictable. Uh, anthropologists have tell us that the ideal size of a clan uh, let me put it more accurately after the first two major migrations that is 65,000 years before our time and 45,000 years before our time let's see about 30,000 years before our time when people were living in uh, Bhimbetka some of you have seen Bhimbetka caves in Madhya Pradesh the ideal size of a clan was about 800 to 900. Anthropologists have done immense amount of work to figure out why 800 or 900 people are necessary to protect the group on all four sides and uh, to communicate with each other, to form regulations, to uh, produce, uh, collect food, distribute reproduction and also uh, uh, making marriages possible within the group endogamous clan based marriages. The properties of these clans increase. I mean a clan with property of cows had a gotra. Go was the defining feature of that clan. So Kula and Gotra. But I am not getting into Kula Gotra. I am not justifying any of those things. I am trying to tell you about the size, the, sc the scale, scale. When, when humans had moved from hunting gathering to past, pastoral, pastoralism and nomadic uh, uh, habits into agriculture, they had started accumulating the surplus of agriculture. And they gained a certain confidence that the surplus may allow them to have larger number in the group, in the clan, in the society than they earlier had. And that was the beginning of their aspiration to build cities. The typical city of Indus had 10,000 population, which is 10 times the size of a clan. That is, with increased capacity to save surplus, because agriculture allowed that, they had aspiration to create a city they had the aspiration to create a civilization. They replicated this. The earliest, uh, the earliest settlements of the, what we call this in, in the civilization, etc., they go back to nearly 3500 years before Christ. The mature phase is 2500 years before Christ to 1900 years before Christ. That's about four and a half thousand years before our time to roughly 4000 years before our time, roughly. Five, six hundred years mature phase, and in that, so many cities were built. They did not build one mega city, 
they built so many cities of the size of 5,000 or 10,000 population, 7,000 population, 80,000 population and so on. Because they thought those cities would survive, but they did not. Because humans had mis of those that time had miscalculated, they had overlooked a possible risk which eventually destroyed that civilization. That risk was not of food supply, not of attacks from outside or floods. The risk was change in the temperature. Because 12,000 years before our time, Holocene began, but there was 2,000 years after 12,000 before this, about 10,000 years before our time, temperature went down once again for almost eight to nine hundred years. And during the Indus time, that is 1900 years before Christ, 4000 years before our time, till about 1500 years before our time, almost 500 years, the weather change changed the landscape. It created desert where there was a rain. It caused water shortage because rain falls in the ground. The scale that they had imagined was a wrong calculation and that's how that civilization went down. This is just Indus. But if, if you go to the, uh, the Assyrian or the Akkadian, they thought that they can maintain the scale of a large city by building armies which as and when necessary can go out and with the use of horses which they had by then actually managed to uh, control, master, could bring materials in. But they did not calculate the risk of allowing young men to go out for long years without being able to produce children locally. So the litter spread, but the local population started fragmenting. And that's the reason why the Assyrian Empire, 2200 years before Christ, they were writing. They have kept records, the kings have kept records. The, for seven or eight hundred years, afterwards the kings remained in the namesake, just as we have some uh, Mokya Pati Saraja and Dakya Pati Saraja in you know, Chota Chota Gaon. The kings remain, but the large cities have gone down. From the middle of the 18th century till now, humans have constructed cities. In America, it was not just the gold rush, but it was also the use of technology. In Europe, it was the production of material that could be sold out, so that could be sold in the, the colonies. In the colonies, uh, cities that would uh, harness raw material and then make them into half-finished goods for supply all over the world. Cities, the scales increase. We today come to a stage when we do not know how to cope with that scale. And very typically, typically I am saying because the human mind always comes up with a solution which is once tried out somewhere till it starts failing them, till it starts failing humans. Our solution appears to be rather ridiculous, and please pardon me for saying this, the idea of going back to the village, the most great nostalgia for village, countryside, I mean how many rich people are building country, country houses, that has happened in England, it doesn't work. We think that if all of us go back to villages, then we will survive as homo sapiens. That is not the answer. The answer is for us to rethink what a city can be. And I am not talking here just of, I am not talking of urban management and so on. I am talking of the ideas which found our city. The Bombay Presidency has an ideological legacy, wealth, if we somehow bring those ideas into legislating, managing, imagining our cities, 
if we say that our cities will cities even if it sounds a self contradiction for a while because we cannot go back to villages anymore our villages are also mentally cities just as our cities are mentally villages we are you know it's a it's a it's a great strength that we have we combine tradition and modernity we combine the rural and the urban we combine male and female yesterday i stopped my last sentence was therefore the great nataraja is you know, kept also the, the the ambivalent the androgynous ashish nandi has this thesis that's a great androgyny is a great instrument of resistance we do not know. gandhi used it in his times but we we have not thought of using it if we can reconceptualize what civilization is from a city like bombay and produce a body of knowledge about asian cities the colonial cities the non western cities the non pilgrimage cities the non empire cities the non dharma cities but the human cities if we can reconceptualize on the basis of what they do what they have done what their intellectual legacies are bring those legacies together we can build a new we can build a new humanism which will allow us to go past this crisis of anthropocene otherwise fukuyama said that this is the end of history uh huntington said that you will always clash each you know among clash of civilizations and your future is to break each other's heads and hatred and contempt and scorn alone seem to be the you know uh, the path side of us we have to change all this i am saying that it is possible to do so i said yesterday just as william jones opened a new vista on thinking about civilization at the beginning of the 19th century and cities were coming up open the new vista thinking of civilization when the cities are seen to be dragging the world down and give this world a new lease of life and please don't think i'm arrogant but i'm saying this kind of work bombay can do this will need a lot of explication a lot of discussion but i feel confident that this can be done and i i said yesterday that i having completed 50 years of my life as an intellectual i want to start a new journey a new voyage is a voyage into study of asia not for accumulating scholarship but for creating action towards regenerating the city the idea of city the idea of civilization so that humans have an existence in future where equality freedom and justice have a chance and where love and conversation and negotiation become the norms thank you so much
you know, kind of unfortunate synonymity used in, particularly in Marathi. Or even in Hindi, but Hindi they have to another word. Civilization and culture, both are translated as Sanskriti. And that creates a problem, because it is not same, obviously, as has been explained properly by Dr. Ganesh Devi. And civilization and culture having equated in the term Sanskriti has raised many issues. One which is familiar today with Indian civilization or Bharatiya civilization. Soon there will be confusion on that because there are millions of books on Indian civilization. And from Republic of India to Republic of Bharat. So we don't object to the word Bharat because it is part of the constitution's very first sentence that India that is Bharat. So it is not a question of uh, ridiculing one idea versus the other. And about the climate and other things that uh, Professor Devi addressed, some of you may be familiar with uh, a Nobel nominated scientist, Martin Rees who wrote a book titled Our Final Hour, which was in America it is known as Our Final Century. According to him, this century is the last century, human century that is, because the climate change will have a catastrophic impact and this century will be over. Not terrorism, he doesn't discuss terrorism, he says climate change. And in that says, it is not only climate change, but also mindless science and mindless technology that is developed. Martin Rees said that about 25 years ago. Recently, even Harari has been voicing the same fear or the same sentiment that maybe we are heading for a catastrophe, in which uh, Harari has said the same thing which I think Einstein said, that everything can be understood and can be fought with except the human stupidity. So, human stupidity seems to be dominating all the, all the civilizations, not only Indian or Bharati or whatever. And the examples are there in Manipur as well as in Ukraine. So, with climate change occurring as a challenge to us, and civilizational continuity, which is our supposed to be a step in direction with Bombay as the center, Bombay as the epicenter for the future, I think it is time we understand how things have changed. For instance, we talk of Asian civilization, but we do not know how Yuan Sun came from China all the way with no roads and nothing and crossing Himalayas and came to Nalanda. And Nalanda was considerably undermined recently by our governments, our institutions. And from Nalanda, he took away all the literature concerning Buddhism and, and the Buddhism spread everywhere in the world except uh, in India, till the new Buddhists came. So how that happened, that entire civilization and transformation, is not even fully studied. Nobody knows much about you, you and Sun. There's hardly any book in Marathi about you and Sun. Or for that matter, not much in English and very little literature is published even from Nalanda. So, the study of civilizations as Professor Devi was advocating should be done and afresh beginning a new era of civilization. For that, we will definitely require the understanding of old era of civilization. I don't think I need to elaborate the ideas that he has explained because there were media of ideas, so many ideas he has explained, so many ideas he has covered, sometimes overlapping, sometimes because of lack of time, not explaining fully. So, if you want further explanation and knowing Asiatic libraries, time fastidiousness, I will not take much of time. I will ask uh, the audience to have questions to Dr. Devi. And those questions should be brief, less as a comment, more as a question, directly addressed to him, not to me. I am just the chair. 
and I think after that it will be on the Raji again at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I missed yesterday, but I'm sure it was recorded. And Kumar, of course, as usual, has uh, thrown a Molotov cocktail of sorts for us to respond. Uh, before I get into that, uh, the idea that you spoke about Trinamool is very interestingly uh, uh, taken up by Bharami in his Kiratar lineage, the great Sanskrit poem, where Arjuna is described as the emblem of this new Ankurs, you know, who combines asceticism and royal gravitas. So that is very, that is one point I wanted to say. And the tension between the city and the forest is also beautifully brought out at the Thunder One episode, for example. And many people think that it is the curse of the Nagas and the aborigines and the wildlife there that eventually did the Yadavas and the Kurus in. Now that is, that is a hypothesis. But uh, do you think that this crisis is sometimes only in our mind in a, in a way, in the sense that we've been hearing about, you know, apocalypse for so many uh, What makes it different now? And what makes it more easy to comprehend given the spread of the web and the way the networking of humanity has changed radically in the last few years? Do you have any idea on that? The uh, country and the city, and the country and the country uh, side. They, 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 they present uh, all through in the future. Gilgamesh also. In uh, Ruchakatikam. Yeah. The forest and the country, they are rebelling against the city. This, uh, all, all of these. And all of these show the destruction of the city. It is the woman's car, uh, or whether it is in Gurukhastha or Sinapur, or Dwaraka. It is Dwaraka. But this time, there are three features of human society. Created by us, but affecting us that need to be paid very careful attention. The first is the use of memory which humans, you know, humans uh, follow. Humans use memory to carry individual experience. What I perceive, uh, food touch, sight, etc., I talk to you, a communication, it becomes neither yours nor mine and it needs to be taken forward to the next generation. So we create, humans created education for that, remembering experiences of all the people in the past, not stories of all the people, but experience in abstract sense, experience of material world, it's a grasp of the material world, grasp of the cosmos, one generation to next generation. For doing that, the humans invented mnemonics, memory tricks. We need a Satrangas, Spectrum, Jitana, Prana, Iki, Nipa, Zaka, Iki, Samra, Nira, Iwa, Mnemonics, Memory Things. All cultures, all people, all nations created. But a time came when they became very complicated and the taxonomies differ from field to field. The taxonomy, the classification table of botany, had no parity. Classification table is mnemonic, is a memory tree. Classification of chemistry, material classification of chemistry was different from the species classification of zoology and botany. These different taxonomies started fragmenting the knowledge fields in Europe in the 16th, 17th, 15th, 16th and 17th centuries. European scholars struggled to bring them together and finally Leibniz solve the problem by creating an abstraction of abstraction. I mean, just to go here, so many judgments, nobody remembers. So they have abstracts of judgments. 
Can you create an abstraction of abstraction? This abstraction of abstraction that Levin is created was in terms of series of 0 and 1. Yeah. I mean, if we just step outside this hall, there's a library. Yeah. And the library has abstracted all books that are in the numbers. And the library knows which book is where. I, you and I have to walk the, you know, half a kilometer of distance there in that part. Library knows at abstraction of abstraction. Now, this abstraction of abstraction was useful for making all knowledge accessible to anybody. Therefore, European saw that access to knowledge as universal access to knowledge. On that basis, they created the university. But the same device used excessively has led to creation of artificial memory. Memory made so easy that even a chip can have memory. And the artificial memory getting further sophisticated has now started dominating human life in such a way that we are all worried as to whether we will continue existence as humans, homo sapiens, or whether we will be half chip, half bone, and become homo deus. This has, and this is a great worry, because the city, I mean, I came to Bombay when I was five years old, first time I came to a tree called Tram, Tram. Now, I still came from village, I used to say Tram. And then... Victoria. Victoria. And I remembered some roads. And as a young man, I walked from church gate all the way to Dadar and once from Dadar to all the way to Bhattopo. As a young man, I walked. But today, every young man, is using this device for finding roads. And every old man and woman have become a young man and a young woman in use of this things. Natural memory is gone out of human society and artificial memory is dominating us. Artificial memory also brings an aid to the of aid of the human capacity to know the past. Because knowledge of the past is dependent on natural memory. Crisis number one. Crisis number ten. Formation of cities has aggravated this. In the villages, people are still able to identify their streets. They are still able to remember names of their cousins and their relatives. The other day I met a lady uh, in Delhi who was in Delhi and she said I belong to a family and then she opened her computer and told me the family, how the family tree and I did not know she did not know. My computer and her computer knows how the family tree. The mind is getting silenced. And if there is no memory, any Freud in the world will tell you there shall be never be dreams because dreams are based on memory. It's a dreamless world. It's, it's an insomnia world, sleepless world, dreamless world. And therefore, uh, democrats are presenting such unrealistic dreams to people in order to fill the vacuum of the missing dreams that you and my, you and my brain is suffering from. That takes me to the second crisis, which is peculiar. There were, of course, bad things. There were tyrants, there were tyrants, there were butchers, you know, there were people that captured a village and chopped everybody's heads. All those things were happening. People were put under elephants. The, the feet, the hooves, or whatever they are called. Uh, the, the people are in the birth at stakes, they are in hand, they are in the short way. All of that doing is happening to us. Where the body was involved, 
the cruelty of that time had a body. Today, the state is doing surveillance of for each one of you. The state knows precisely where you are lost. And for that, you do not have to stay outside your home. The state has entered not your, just your, we used to say when the television came that you know, now this uh, entertainment has entered your drawing rooms. You don't need a drawing room. The state is with you till the moment every night you close your eyes because the last thing you see before you go to bed is the screen of your phone. And the first thing you see when you wake up is the screen of your phone. And the state is, you think you are holding a machine which you can control. It is the state that is holding you to this machine. The surveillance is so much that today the police will not behave like the police. Unless the state wants the police to behave like the police, the judges will not behave like judges. Unless the state wants them to behave like the the teachers will not teach what they should teach unless the state approves what they teach. The state is so pervasive that it has taken away the citizen's space. So memory gone, citizenry gone. And the third thing, there was a time when fascism increased in Europe. Thinkers like Anna Red say that so what if fascists are there and they put in constitution caps, you can still speak. And Anna Red say that speaking, continue to speak, raise your voice, and it will one day aid fascism. But my biology friends tell me, I think that the, uh, no, I did not say it here, that the broker's law which analyzes the world through language, through sound, has developed a strange kind of fatigue. And it is therefore that children no longer in school, children do not want to read, they cannot read, they cannot write, they cannot speak. Because humans are moving, humans as a species, moving to a new perception, new method of perceiving the world. And it is through visual images, through the pre-control products, not through the broker's work, not through sound. Because sound as a medium of communication will not work in interplanetary space, there is no air there. So if I shout, you know, I go to the South Pole of the moon and say, hey, I am hungry, nobody is going to hear what I say because my voice will not be carried. Therefore, digital, electromagnetic, Thus, work as our speech. Hannah Arendt said, speak, then fascism will end. But speech is going out of Silence is surveying human space. There are 7,000 living languages in the world. Predictions and a good calculated scientific prediction is at least 4,000 languages will die in the next 30 years. The remaining will become dilapidated. They will become languages with pure layers of meaning. Already people no longer understand humor, they no longer understand metaphor. They have, those who are Marathi or Gujarati speakers know that the proverbs have gone out of language. My mother used so many proverbs, they had every five sentences. There is no proverb at all. It's, it's, it's colorless language because language is at had end of its existence. These three conditions, language going out of humans, humans going out of language, vocal, verbal language, and entering a visual, digital language, humans entering a digital world, humans entering a post-memory world, and humans entering a world where continuous surveillance will disallow any aspect, individual aspiration of democratic nature. These are the challenges created by, and what I say now is the most important, a wonderful book written by Waspit. Waspit is the last name. Uh, 
Matthias Rosfeld, Hungarian thinker, 2022 publication, it has come to Bombay. Go and buy a copy. He says if people start believing that by making lots of regulations, the state will give you security, increased security, people start believing that. And if people start hankering for security and they go out and uh, make themselves an insurance-driven society. Waspet says that in America they not just insure their health and homes and libraries and wealth, they also take insurance of their insurance. <laughs> and this is terrified, frightened society looking at the state for making maximum number of regulations and therefore believing that the state will save us and keep us secure and the democrats at the top of the state constantly telling you look i am giving you security i am there why do you worry i am there to protect you this i mean not just in india in every country this is the situation every country is the situation because the city people have invited upon humanity these three calamities. And so if we can reconceptualize the city as a place for conversation, as a place for negotiation, as a place for assimilation, then we will be able to change the streets in the world and we'll be able to perhaps save the human from the spectrum of the machine intelligence and keep human relations within the realm of what we still can call the homo sapiens. You asked for a, this long run because you said what are the special features. I did not want to upset you and terrify you and depress you to this evening, that's why I have not mentioned all this. But this is what we have. And that's why civilization. Civilization today means taking the state. work as a 
our speech. Hannah arranged to speak, then Hassan will be in. But speech is going out of silence, is surveying human space. There are 7,000 living languages in the world. Predictions and a good calculated scientific prediction is at least 4,000 languages will die in the next 30 years. The remaining will become dilapidated. They will become languages with pure layers of meaning. Already people no longer understand humor, they no longer understand metaphor. They have those who are Marathi or Gujarati speakers know that the proverbs have gone out of language. My mother used so many proverbs. They have every five sentences. There is no proverb at all. It's, it's, it's colorless language because language is that we have end of the These three conditions. Language going out of humans. Humans going out of language. Vocal, verbal language and entering a visual digital language. Humans entering a digital world. Humans entering a post-memory world. And humans entering a world where continuous surveillance will disallow any aspect, individual aspiration of democratic nature. These are the challenges created by and what I say now is the most important a wonderful book written by Waspit. Waspit is the last name. Uh, Matthias Waspit, Hungarian thinker, 2022 publication. It has come to Bombay. Go and buy a He says if people start believing that by making Lots of regulations, the state will give you security, increased security. People start believing that. And if people start hankering for security, and they go out and uh, make themselves an insurance driven society. Waspet says that in America, they not just insure their health and homes and libraries and wealth, they also take insurance of their insurance. And this is terrified, frightened society looking at the state for making maximum number of regulations and therefore believing that the state will save us and keep us secure. And the democrats at the top of the state constantly telling you, look, I am giving you security, I am there. Why do you worry? I am there to protect you. This, I mean, not just in India, in every country this is the situation. Every country is the situation because the city people have invited upon humanity these three calamities. And so if we can reconceptualize the city as a place for conversation, as a place for negotiation, as a place for assimilation, then we will be able to change the streets in the world and we will be able to perhaps save the human from the spectrum of the machine intelligence and keep human relations within the realm of what we still can call the homo sapiens. You asked for a, this long run because you said what are the special features? I did not want to upset you and terrify you and depress you with this meeting, therefore I have not mentioned all this. But this is what we have. And that's why civilization. Civilization today means taking the state. Civilization means allowing people to speak. Thank you. So I, I wanted to ask you, is it not possible to use technology and media, media as a means of achieving exactly what you are saying? For example, uh, you know, the problems that you spoke about, and it's a very valid uh, uh, proposition. All you have to do, I'm not, I'm not trivializing what you said. It exists in a database somewhere if you are smart enough to mine. Your point is also beautifully taken that the human contact, the human, is absolutely necessary. My submission is, is it possible to co-opt technology in a way that is humanistic. Why not we think in that, that way? I said two features of civilization have been, I mean human progress is use of technology, 
making technology sophisticated and, and thinking of scales. This time, it is not the use of technology, but it is the scale of technology that we are doing. And then our cities can be protected. Anybody else? No, I don't think I have it warned. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ganesh Ji, for, uh, for the nice speech and the knowledgeable speech you gave. I have two questions to ask. Can I ask, please? Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so the question one is. You told yesterday about clash of clash of clash of civilization. About that, so so what do you think about now this is not relevant? Can we know uh, uh, what about in World War One? That it happened, World War Two. Is it like it's it's a useless thing to happen? Because, because uh, you just said that in the 16th century they, uh, they were fighting out everything. But now in the 19th century they, they are like, like I'm the strongest, you are fascism and nazism and all that about the Hitlers and who became Muslim and all that. So is it like uh, uh, they, they, they have only, only made, uh, made themselves group form and made, uh, also Think of America's creating uh, trouble with Afghanistan with regard to that. And then you realize what is the nature of this clash of civilization. The idea of clash of civilization is an American idea. It justifies clashes. World War I and World War II was not, was not, uh, I don't know, was not a war that sought to justify some idea. World War I was a symptom of weakening of the colonial regimes. World War II was a change of the world order which Europe had created from the treaty of the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, 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 80s. All nations will create a uh, protective relationship. Uh, but uh, that was changing and at the end of that war they created the United Nations. This clash of civilization idea that America created was immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall, immediately after the dissolution of the USSR, and it was created at the end of Thatcherite economies having come to the center stage. It was a different universe. It was a great, a greatly dehumanized universe that was being created. And to justify creation of such an universe, and in a non-polar universe, America trying to re, uh, re, uh, re, uh, replace itself, refine its place, the idea was proposed by political advisor to the President of America. And all of us thought that this was a great scholarly thing. And we thought, this is how the world has been. I am saying that Asian civilizations, by and large, have been civilizations, civilizations that have been accommodated. And therefore, in none of the Asian countries, except Russia, if Russia is Asian, we have experienced revolutionary changes. There have been gradual changes. We, we need to write this. I think I answered your question yesterday, and I answered your question today, and if you don't mind, since there are other questions, I'll answer your third question in private time today. Thank you. Sir, you said that but if we speak on CK, is the shape reason, is the, uh, the, the people who wanted to listen what we are speaking, if they are deaf, who for the purpose of speaking? And uh, my question to you is that uh, the dinosaurs dies because of the calamity of some uh, uh, So this, my question is that is the human being action because of the technology that you say that is Genetic PTA, that is the gen PTA. So, is this 
that will be the cause for our extinction. The AI that we are invented will actually be a cause for our extinction. Was it, uh, was a matter of natural evolution and disappearance of species that was not fit to survive and so on going by Darwin's description of this species? Natural calamities have pushed many species to extinction. With the Homo sapiens, for the first time in the process of the natural evolution, and a, a brain got evolved, which knows precisely how to rebel against nature and formulate something, create something which is not natural. Till the Homo sapiens, all of the species belong to nature and they live with nature or within nature, with natural humans, though bound by nature as the framework for biological existence, have yet figured out some ways of cheating nature. For instance, in this room, the temperature that you have is not natural temperature, it's human-made temperature. Other species don't have that temperature. The light you have is not natural light, it is human-made light. The human intellect has rebelled against nature for the first time in the process of evolution. And that that rebellion of the human brain is a step further in the process of evolution. It is not outside, but it is bringing in nature in a different light. And therefore, when the humans will disappear by way of uh, ecological disaster or not, is a question that we need to look at very carefully once again. Because in the Pleistocene, that is before Holocene, 7,000 years of extreme cold weather had wiped out most of the species. Humans survived and some other species survived. The, uh, I refer to uh, this uh, Bimbetka caves. Between the Bimbetka cave people and the uh, people in Iran who started agriculture in Ecuador, there was a phase of 7,000 years of extreme cold weather. Most other plant and animal species perished. But when humans realize that they have the ability to rebel against nature, they have taken it, you know, the, the, they have crossed the, the, the viral scale. And the destruction of species caused by human use of natural resources is 4,000 times the scale of the last time species were destroyed. That means the last destruction, whatever time was taken, whatever happened over 4,000 years, we managed to destroy in a single year. So humans getting destroyed because of ecological changes is one kind of question. But humans destroying whether the ecological change or not, and humans inviting ecological change leading to destruction of species is a different matter. We need to cope with that. The chat GPT invented by humans, that is artificial intelligence, is becoming so strong that it will, it will do different, the human brain will not be so intelligent than the chat GPT. So, my question is to you is the technology will rule us. Forget the economy. Yes, that fear is shared by all of us. I feel very worried about it. I feel very worried about it. The uh, humans have always uh, invented technology and felt scared of what they have invented always. And they learn to over overcome that fear and tame what they have created. But there is this story of marriage uh, shame, campaign sign. There may be a moment when it might that fear is always there. Um, I don't know. I am an optimist. I don't want to say to say. I want to say let's think together, let's collectively. Collective action can always open up new vistas of future where possibilities exist. But that is not a thinking that states should do for us, or technology should do for us. 
we have to come together and think. I mean, in this we were discussing this question. We should continue to discuss it and bring some of the best things that humans have created together in order to save humans from the error that humans have created for us. So if it is a human problem, humans must come together to solve it. And that's, that's why I said a new human, a new humanism can be created if we work together. It is possible. It's not too late. Okay. And that's the actually voice of what you have called the pessimistic ending of the film. And the world will be destroyed by, as you say, by the human created nuclear bomb. The last scene of the film and last thing I'm also says, however, I understand the dialogue is there. It is in our time that we say it or correct make it go. This actually, which is also an answer and also a paradox. First of all, really fascinating to listen to you. Uh, when you were talking about the way the India's study civilization built those cities, you get talking about they built the city and we ended with saying that we all have to think together to build a new kind of civilization. I was wondering how do you conceptualize this day? Because there, how is it that some civilizations are successful in building a civilization with a certain kind of vision? And uh, because we all feel at some level powerless. You know, what is how am I going to uh, make a difference? So I would like to know what is this conception of day that you kept referring to? Okay, three things about this. I mean, that's a clear question. And it's a question that chess players normally pose. My first say, first, first move is to say that we normally think that Pukara is a Maharashtra theater. And Gandhi thought about Indian independence. But we need to realize that Gandhi thought of internationalism of India. Why? He was also an independent movement for a nation, and so was Tagore. If we think of our intellectual legacies and spiritual legacies as legacy of the entire humanity, we liberate ourselves from this narrow framework of nation, Marathi identity. Amcha, Sanskritiksa, Mukutamani. No, let it be Mukutamani, let it be less shining jewel in the range of jewels in the world. We, if we are ready to lose our sense of identity, then we will liberate ourselves and we can liberate the world. Step in the world. But, I mean, think of this, how sharp has our sense of identity become? Me Maratha, me Marat Maharashtra, me Amo, me Bharati. We forget that we belong to Homo sapiens who collectively facing this collectivities. And therefore nation is a pixel idea. It's a time, it's time, time is over. We never think universally. And those who are thinking of nation, nationality and sacrifice for they actually dragging you down the path of this. So we have to be clear about it. I mean, I am not making a political statement. I am making a statement way beyond politics, way beyond you know, contemporary politics. But unless, uh, we have to be deeply political in order to understand our politics. Not deeply political is not politics of commitment, but politics of freedom. So that will also reduce our scorn for each other. And it will allow us to appreciate great things and good things all over this wider region. We created cities all along the last thousand years. When Europe has been telling us that you fought only Muslims and demonized the Muslims, we have to understand that actually these are people who built caravansarais who preached the idea that food can be eaten only if it is shared, who said that out of your income at least a part has to go 
they did not want, they did not require tax regime of the taxes to go and from the government collect all money to solve it. Zakat is what? Now GST or what? The second step is knowledge. First is to own our legacy as universal legacy to live it. Second is to use our knowledge in a, in a critical way and to see if we made any mistakes. What are the flaws in us? Europe to conquer the rest of the world because Europe is accepted that they lack something. They have to go out. We must, we must learn to be, to learn the humility to accept that we lack something. And therefore we need to get something from ourselves. So that is, that is the beginning of giving and taking. And the third is to embed this give and take of thought and material as an essential value in education fields of knowledge and build our knowledge fields on the foundation of exchange, conversation and negotiation as the highest principle of civilization. If these three steps we can take, then the world will be a different place. And Bombay has all these three things. I mean Bombay is known for this exchange here. What is it called? CBSC, not CBSC. Who get money and draw other people's money to their pockets? What do you want to say? Ah, that's okay. Bombay is the place where you can create beings of all kinds in a place called Film City. Make people believe. Bombay is the place where Parsis, Boras, Gujarati, Jews, Marathas, everybody is welcome. Bombay is a great idea. We must look at it differently. And I think it will give us some hope and it can give hope to the rest of the world. We will not look at it as a scholar only. Look at it as a combination of traditional modernity, of Eastern ways, of youth and old age, of faith and skepticism. And then, uh, I mean, you have a great mosque and right opposite the mosque, there are people uh, uh, getting into inter-religious love of this. That's Bombay, it's beautiful. You have Ganesha coming and then there are people singing songs from cinema. Uh, after having a good, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, a few or two or something else. That's Bombay. Bombay, the energy of Bombay, the transgression that Bombay allows uh, could be a positive one. Unless there is, sir, I will allow the one question last. Good evening, dear sir. My name is Abhimanyu Agarwal. I attended your uh, session yesterday also, and I have to say I was very enlightened. And uh, I just want to ask you that you said the uh, civilization should be built on values such as love and uh, conversation. So, to redefine civilization in the modern age. Do we need to build a new city with these values or can we reintroduce or implement these values in uh, already existing cities? Bombay, for example, like you said, uh, was a prototype for the future at some point and it is beautiful. But uh, today you said, also said that many cities are facing decline. So uh, is there a way that we can make these three existing cities restored to their form of glory and redefine civilization? Uh, and reading civilization, uh, and if so, how can we do so? Very yes. 11. Yes. 11. And then you have windows, so you open the windows. You wake up and you open the windows and you see the sky. Then next morning you get up and you see the sky. Every day the sky looks different, isn't it? Or the same, I don't know. There must be some days when the sky looks like a different. <laughs> Open your eyes and look at Bombay. Just as you look at this, the sky is the same. It's your eyes. Bombay, we don't have to rebuild the Bombay again. They did a like, Navi Mumbai Yogare Kurum. That's not the solution. Satellite Bombay is. They're doing four satellite downloads. That's not the solution. 
we need to look at Bombay with fresh eyes. And you will see everything that the future brings there. I am not saying everything in Bombay is all right. I said the second step is to know what flaws there are. And so we must take things from us. So like how Bombay has rethink re civilization in the past, can it also rethink civilization today? For the future. For the future. If we make Bombay better, we will have a future. If we make Bombay worse, we will have only the past. If you study school textbooks. Because our past begins only 1000 years and before that. For the last 1000 years we are told that nothing good existed. We need a future, so you rebuild Bombay nicely, make it better by being critical, by asking questions, by raising voice, by telling that the state cannot change people, people can change the state. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is because the chairman has ruled it out, but in Rajya Sabha there is convention of disobeying the chairman. So you can ask one question and then I will ask. Uh, I attended both your lectures. Uh, my name is Uttala uh, So you just said that I'm allowed to be critical. So uh, I just wanted to ask you that, uh, do you think it's very convenient to always keep blaming the state for all our, uh, you know, all our problems? Uh, because the constant surveillance that you're talking about of the state. Uh, I find that, you know, probably the state is supposed to sometimes come in. Because there, there is an inherent uh, distrust between communities. And you think that Manipur is an example of that? The problems exist, and that, that's why the state is sometimes supposed to come in and intervene. And we, when there's a crisis, we want the state to intervene. Rules us. The state is a creature of the constitution. Or is the constitution a creature of the state? What is your understanding? Who created what? Did the state create the constitution or the constitution create the state? Constitution created the state. So the state that remains within the framework of the constitution is a well behaving state. If it decides to transgress, cross the limits of the constitution, it is a badly behaving state. It's clear. The constitution is saying India, that is part of the union of states. The state who runs it must obey that, follow that. But if whoever runs it keeps saying that no, you shall not use the name India, you shall use only the name Bharat, that is an insult to the constitution. If I protest against this kind of you know, instruction that say only Bharat, I protest against it. And they say you go to jail because you protested against the state because the state is protecting the people and you are challenging the state. Therefore you are challenging the people, therefore you are enemy of the people, you are anti-national. I think it's a wrong kind of state. As simple as that. Now your question is, does, does, is everything that the state does is bad? The answer is no. The state is created by the constitution. The constitution is endorsed at least in principle by the people. So long as the people want the constitution will enjoy its complete supremacy in the country. If the people decide otherwise, it's another thing. But if the state, state, decides unilaterally to violate the constitution or, de or demean it, diminish its state, then it is an over-ambitious over state. It is overplaying its role. And even if it is overplaying in order to establish some kind of ideal rapture, say of, say, let's say whatever, this or that uh, you know, name, uh, that's not a good idea because that uh, that Rajya existed some time ago, some uh, three, four, five thousand years ago. 
this condition came to be about 70 years back after a great struggle of the people for independence. And hence, what the state does may not be bad at any time, but every time the state crosses the, the, the principles of constitutionality, then it makes the state apparatus worse than what it was in the past. Every regime is expected to make the state apparatus better. But if a regime makes the state apparatus worse than what it was, that regime is responsible for making the state look like a prison. And a prison is not good for a free, independent, autonomous people. So what is people? So, Mangalaji? Okay, okay. Well. On behalf of the uh, Mumbai Research Centre and the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, thank you, Dr. Devi, for two days of absolutely sincerated hard truths that we are not going to get anywhere else. You have also left us with a lot of food for thought for a long time to come. The question and answer sessions were indeed very, very thought provoking, and thank you so very much for both the days of fabulous answers. I also thank you, Mr. Kirikar, for taking time out to chair this session and adding to the luster of this. Thank you, audience. Thank you, staff of the ASF. And we hope to see you again for our future lectures. Just for information, on the 8th and the 15th, we are having our next series of lectures. And it is about the sun pictures, advent of photography in Bombay. So hope to see you there. Good night. And thank you. And today I got many messages from people who are present and not present here. Saying that if you if you start an initiative, civilization initiative, they would like to join. So I have uh, said a response to everybody that maybe about three months from now, sometime in the month of November, on some Sunday, all those who are interested in joining this, I think after all, this initiative. So initiative civilization initiative, those who want to join, we congregate somewhere in Bombay on 3rd of November, which is a Sunday. So just you know keep this in case you feel that well what this madman was saying was uh, sufficiently mad, crazy, then do meet me on 3rd of November, somewhere in Bombay. You will find a place somewhere. Why not on the third in the Asiatic itself? Well, we have the invite. It's Thank Sunday, you. second, second, second. Second, second. Sunday, second. Sunday, second. Sunday is closed. Sunday is closed. Can we break open? No, no, we can have it on the second. On the second. We can meet on the steps. Second. Then is Saturday, Sunday. Okay, we will meet on the second of November. Here, here. Right. Uh, from morning to evening. Because many people want to speak. I have got at least 20 or you know, requests saying that make us part of this initiative. So let's let Asia to society start thinking of Asia again. And uh, Asia was a very English word and it was a beautiful word to only with that. So I said to my friends, let's think of Asia. And then don't, don't change names, I hate that. Not so. I said I love Persian, my Persian name. Don't no, no, Asia. We will meet in Asia Society. So so we will meet in Asia Society so yeah. to think of Asia. <laughs> Ashiana, our own. Okay. 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 Okay.